Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on uh, risk-based approach in risk management. My name is Esbusiso Lamini from the Financial Intelligence Center. I hope you are going to enjoy this session today, and I hope that it's going to be informative for you to be able to do your day-to-day -day business without any hindrance. Uh, without any further delay, I'll just uh, like to take you through to our agenda on what is going to be the order of the day. So our agenda for today, uh, we are going to start with a program overview. From there, we are going to have an overview of what FATF, MER, which is a mutual evaluation report, recommendations and findings regarding risk assessment are. And we're going to look at the risk-based approach. After risk-based approach, we're going to look at the risk management compliance program. So, colleagues, uh, we're going to start by telling you actually what is the Financial Action Task Force. This is the intergovernmental body that sets out standards and protects effective implementation of legal, regulatory, and operational measures for combating money laundering and terrorist financing and other related threats to the integrity of the international financial system. So FATF uh, issued 40 recommendations, and then these recommendations are the basics of what entails or what money laundering, terrorist financing, and, terror terror and, and proliferation financing is. So FATF has 30, uh, 37 members, membership uh, countries uh, from different jurisdictions, and then South Africa falls within two regional organizations. So these uh, jurisdictions represent most of major financial centers across the world. And South Africa is a member of the FATF and the regional body of the East and Southern African anti laundering group, which is abbreviated or its acronym is ASEMELEC. And South Africa is the only actually African member of the SAMELEC. There was a mutual evaluation report conducted by peers, our peers from the FATF that took place in 2019. And out of that mutual evalu evaluation, there are a lot of questions that were asked on South Africa, a uh, money laundering system or finance uh, system. So on that, money, on that mutual evaluation, questions were asked on how, for example, South Africa deals with risks that are associated with money laundering. Property practitioners are one of the entities that are identified uh, as entities that needed more understanding on how to deal with risks that emanate from money laundering. But we'll go in detail uh, later when we go through our presentation. So, and then what was actually discussed, the, one of the issues that I identified or, during that uh, mutual evaluation report is that South Africa should ensure that it acts adequately or accountable institutions when it comes to money laundering, like property practitioners. They need to act accordingly and identify the risks that are posed by clients when it comes to money laundering. So it was requested that accountable institutions or property practitioners need to apply a risk-based approach and they need to have a risk compliance management uh, program. This will assist them to mitigate the risk that uh, is posed on the industry and by the client and the authorities should provide better guidance to these matters and on a major money laundering or trust financing or proliferation financing. That is why we are sitting here today and having this discussion. So one of the recommendations that were passed by FATF through the mutual evaluation is that South Africa should ensure that uh, the business that is conducted or the risks that are identified should be systemically identified. And we should also include a sufficient range of inherent risk factors to identify and understand the money laundering risk and at any level, or entity level, client level, or a business uh, level. That will include what type of corruption could be, we could be exposed to, a geographical risk and the use of cash, where there's a lot of cash that is used maybe to buy property or rent property, and you should know if that money is used to uh, launder or clean the demand that criminals have uh, attained. So on the, your risk management compliance problem, uh, program, you need to identify this risk put measures in place to mitigate these risks and make sure that you manage and monitor the risk on an ongoing base, uh, 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 basis. That will, uh, that's what will entail your risk-based approach. And then as we move forward, so amongst regulated DNFPPs, so DNFPPs are designated non-financial businesses and professionals. So these businesses will include your attorneys, your property practitioners, your accountants and all uh, other businesses that are not on a stream on, on a stream of business. 
and then oh, including gambling entities that would be your casinos or people who are running bingo machines or any of, of those entities so these institutions according to the FIC Act, they have obligations that they need to adhere to so according to the mutual evaluation report these entities <coughs> excuse me these entities don't understand these obligations that uh, are bestowed upon them so accountable institutions and property practitioners or legal uh, uh, practitioners as well, they tend to have to heavily rely on the partners for money laundering. So, for example, if an attorney is dealing with a property practitioner who's purchasing probat, uh, property, they'll point uh, fingers on each other that no uh, identification and verification of clients should be done by one party. But both of them should actually identify and verify the clients that they are entering into business with. So based on the discussion with the other DNFPPs while there was that mutual version report, uh, sectors, assessors from uh, the FATF believe that this comes from a limited knowledge of applicable uh, applicable to the amended Financial Intelligence Center Act and what the Financial Intelligence Center Act requires. So following the removal of many exemptions, the exemptions is that, for example, if someone was identifying and verifying a client on your behalf, you'll be exempt from doing the same because that uh, part of the business has, uh, of the transaction has been done. The amendment of the Act removed that portion that each and every accountable institution should do that in their own right. So the new RMCP requirement is, is a big challenge for accountable institutions, for most DNFPPs, including legal practitioners, property practitioners, trust companies, service providers, and gambling entities. So that's why we are having these, uh, these sessions, so that we make sure that you understand what is required of you and why you have to do it in your own right as an entity, although you might be having other entities that you are dealing with. So another issue that they raise is that TNFPPs have a, an undeveloped understanding of money laundering risk that varies significantly. And then so property practitioners to be specific, uh, in most cases they don't want to do anything that's administrative intent because most of their business is based on sales or you focus on sales that no, the more number of uh, transactions that you have or houses that you have or rental property that you issue if you're in property management the better you manage your property the easier it will be then dealing with the paperwork that comes with that but now we need to change that ideology we need to take that head off and put a head we are going to focus on the business and how do we deal uh, with money laundering risks that might be posed by our business our clients the geographic area that we're dealing uh, uh, with or the type of business that we are entering into so casinos are better in assessing money laundering risk but they need uh, further steps to improve their rpa we are going to forget about casinos, but it's an example that we are putting forward that because we are dealing with the NFPPs as a whole. The lack of adequate supervision compounds this uh, issue for legal practitioners, while property practitioners, that's why we have this part of our presentation bolded. Is it a chance, you remember that after the act was changed to a uh, PPRA act, we are no longer ECD agents now, we're property practitioners and legal practitioners, uh, attorneys, do not appear to adequately identify the money laundering risk associated, associated with property or real estate. So ongoing monitoring is negligible uh, due to lack of understanding of the risk that are posed by the industry. So we're going to look at recommendation one uh, that is brought uh, uh, about by the FATF uh, 40 recommendations. The first thing that they request of us is assessing risks and applying a risk-based approach. So South Africa is a member of FATF, as I mentioned a, a, a bit earlier. So accountable institutions or countries within those, uh, accountable institutions or accountable institutions within the countries that form part of the FATF should understand money laundering, proliferation and terrorist financing risk and apply a risk-based approach and allocate resources in accordance with the risk that has been identified. And then financial institutions and DNFPPs, which is property practitioners, they need to identify, assess, and take effective action to mitigate their money laundering risk, terrorist financing, or proliferation risk. Institutions must apply risk-based approach as an effective way to combat money laundering. And countries like South Africa must understand the money laundering risk related to particular sectors. What we need to know is, uh, as accountable or property practitioners, we need to understand the risk at the country level, uh, sector level and in individual institutions. Institutions could be a client that are dealing with for the specific transaction. And institutions must take effective actions to mitigate 
or put measures in place to control whatever risks they might have identified. Now I'm just going to take you to a brief highlight of what do I mean when I uh, talk about a risk-based approach for property practitioners and then what measures you can put in place or how you can work on making sure that you have plans in place to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. And then now what... Uh, you remember that earlier I mentioned that uh, there was a mutual evaluation uh, assessment that took place in 2019. So in March 2021, the, that there was a report that was issued by uh, FATF on, we call it a mutual evaluation report because they are peers who came and tested us. So what they said after they, they, they conducted their test, one of their findings was that uh, we are, as South Africa, or as uh, academic institutions, we are static and reactive rather than dynamic. And then we may miss important trigger events or incidents and structure changes to threats and vulnerabilities. So what does it mean? It means that we don't have <clears throat> controls or systems in place that will identify any form of money laundering before it happens. We only react once it has happened. So risk assessment starts at a national level, uh, national level sexual level, in institutional, and we drill it down to the client level. And there are several criteria to consider when performing a risk assessment. So we should know and then we should bear in mind that accountable institutions must first have an understanding of what money laundering or terrorist financing risk present or is presented by geographic area or the client that they're dealing with. And then what type of organizations they're dealing with, what type of product offering, type of clients, flow of funds, are the funds that you're dealing with from South Africa? Are they from a country that maybe is sanctioned? Are they from a country that is a volatile environment? Is someone who's a, who's a politician client trying to clean a dirty money by buying property and then sells the property quicker after two or three days? So the, those are, are questions that you need to ask yourself as a, a a property practitioner. Once understood, this risk, you must tell yourself how much tolerance do you have as an accountable institution. If you have a higher risk tolerance and then you have measures in place to deal with such risk, you put it in writing and then you make sure that you understand those uh, risks. What methodologies are, are determined for mitigation of the specified risk? Against this understanding, a risk-based approach must be applied in compliance with customer due diligence and obligations bestowed upon accountable institutions by the Financial Intelligence Center Act. So what do you do when you have to conduct this specific risk assessment? So we are going to highlight, we're going to uh, look at uh, the national risk assessment uh, detail for money laundering from a South African perspective. And then we are going to highlight areas that uh, need concern, for example, uh, corruption. So this is at a national level. At a central level, we have to uh, perform those are performed by actually supervisory bodies based on feedback that is received from industries. So if someone from the PPRA asks us a question on the type of risk that they're exposed to, we have to look at them, analyze them, and see how we can meet the challenges that are posed by those specific risks. And the result, as a result, the supervisory bodies will identify areas that we need to focus on when we are doing the supervision of the specific section of the Act. And the institutional risk must be understood uh, before client risk assessment can uh, commence. So before take on, before you enter into any business or any transaction with a client, you must identify and understand this risk and then make a decision whether you accept the risk or you don't, and then you carry on afterwards, and then you know whether you are going to continue with the, the client or not. Institutional risk assessment, how do you do that? You need to allow for a risk framework to be implemented with an aid in understanding what the malingering risk uh, you are faced with as an entity, and then how are you going to mitigate those risks as well? And then this is only applicable from here, or from here onwards, and actually you will be able to apply the risk-based approach. At a later part of our presentation, we're going to look at the risk management compliance program. That should be your tool that you're going to use so that you are able to mitigate and apply all the requirements uh, that are obligated or are applications on property practitioners as uh, stipulated under the Financial Intelligence Center Act. Now, I, I we're going to look at the risk management compliance program. This is the tool that you as an accountable institution or a property practitioner, you must have. It must be as detailed as possible because when it happens that any supervisory body, it could be the FIC, it could be anyone else who will, will be knocking at your offices and asking for your RMCP, you should have a detailed plan that or a program that will show us that you have measures in place to deal with 
the risk that you have identified as an entity. As an entity. So in RMC, in RMCP, uh, it's related under Section 42 of the FIC Act. This is an application on accountable institution that you have to have, you must have an accountable institution. So what are accountable institutions supposed to do? They need to develop and implement an RMCP at the, government at the governance level of the organization. They must apply a risk-based approach. They must conduct a customer due diligence on all their clients. They must make sure that the people they're dealing with are not uh, part of the sanctioned people, or they must look at what targeted financial sanctions entail. They must look at politically exposed uh, persons because they tend to be high risk due to corruption, as I mentioned earlier, and the use of public funds in a manner that is not supposed to be, uh, that's not in accordance with what they are allocated for. Account monitoring and reporting to the FIC. We have uh, different uh, reports that are required by in terms of, of the FIC, specifically, especially Section 28, where you have to report all the transactions uh, that are above the amount of 24,999 or anything above 25,000. Any transaction as an accountable institution that is above 25,000 rents, you need to report to the FIC. Record keeping. You need to keep records of any transaction for five years. Five years from the last day of the transaction. So if you have a transaction today, keep the records for five years after the transactions because anyone can come, whether it's an enforcement body uh, or supervisory body or a legal entity might come asking for those uh, transactions as required by the FIC Act. You need to be able to produce them for even after the transaction was completed, but for the period, period of five years after. Registration. As an accountable institution, you need to register with the uh, FIC Act so that you will be monitored. Otherwise, you'll be transgressing or non-compliant with the FIC Act if you don't register and practice as a property practitioner. So now, we're looking at the first part from the previous slide. We are going to look at Act governance. Uh, on the left-hand side, we're going to have our topic, and then we'll have uh, RMCP uh, governance. The second part is a section of the Act, and then we'll look at issues that must be addressed, and then we'll look at the guidance documents that you can uh, have a look at when you have time. These are documents that we can read for you to attain more knowledge and then how to apply the risk-based ap approach, specifically in this topic, how can you ad ad enhance or advance your risk management, management compliance uh, program. So the first topic that we are going to look at is uh, according to Section 42 uh, 2Q of the FIC Act, we are going to look at RMCP governance. So uh, when you are drafting your RMCP, you need to ensure that the RMCP is implemented in branches if you are a, a head office or a, a mother body. And then from branches, it should uh, cascade down or slide down to subsidiaries or other operations of the institution in foreign countries. If the institution does not have any branches, then it must indicate in its RMCP that Section 42 2Q of the FIC Act is not applicable to them. For more information, as I mentioned a bit earlier, please uh, look through, uh, 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 just go and read Guidance Note 7 and Draft PCC 114. We are also working on uh, updating Guidance Note 7 with uh, Draft Guidance Note 7A, which focuses mostly on how to draft an RMCP. While for this, what is for the two to R explain how the RMCP is going to be implemented, and then you need to detail that in your RMCP document as well. Section forty two to be the document approval of the RMCP by the board of directors, senior management, or the person exercising the highest level of authority in the accountable institution. So that simply means if it's the CEO who's the highest uh, authority, he needs to sign it off. If, if it's a director, and then it needs to be presented on those executive meetings, and then it should, needs to be approved, approved and adopted by the institution. Section 42 2C, uh, detail when the RCP must be reviewed and keeps evidence of track or to check the review and or updates. That simply means if it's viewed quarterly, biannually, or annually, that must be specified in the RMCP in the terms of the review. And then how often are you going to review and update your RMCP? As we continue, and then now we're going to look at session 42, 3, make the RMCP available to employees so that your employees understand and know what risk they are dealing with. Session 42, uh, 4, Detail how to send a copy of the RMCP to the FIC or your supervisory body when required. Because uh, it will happen that maybe your institution will be one of the institutions who are selected 
for a supervisory or for a, an on-site visit where the FIC will come and knock at your door and request that you show us what you have in place. And it must be readily available and it must be easily accessible when the FIC asks for the document. Section 42 uh, 2S, we need to assign a compliance officer uh, responsible for ensuring the effectiveness of the institution's compliance function who is knowledgeable of the FIC Act and the institution's RMCP that the sufficient there's, that, has, that has sufficient seniority to ensure compliance with the FIC Act and the institution's RMCP. So when you appoint your compliance officer or the person who will be responsible for this part of risk management of the organization, it should be someone who won't be second-guessing him or herself, but who will be able to be author authoritative and will be able to give guidance and direction to an organization without fear of anyone within the organization. Section 42 2S continued, uh, determine how often training will take place, in what format and who must attend. Training needs to include the aspects of the FIC Act and its institutions RMCP so that the organization's employees understand what it entails or what type of risk they need to be aware of and then how do they report, should they, they need to arise, should they need arise for them to report to a specific uh, supervisory body. Now uh, what we are looking at, uh, we are going to go on to the next slide where we will be looking at the risk assessment and uh, the rating that we will attach to the risks that are identified. So now uh, the topic again is uh, the obligations based out upon the accountable institutions or private practitioners by the FIC Act and then we are looking at the risk-based approach and then we are continuing where we are looking at section 42 to A where an accountable institution before he does anything on the RMCP or on the risk-based approach, they need to identify the risk, assess the risk per section or for the organization, they need to mitigate, to mitigate the risk that has been identified, and they need to manage the specific risk that the provisions of the goods for, or services, for example, by accountable institutions may involve or facilitate money laundering and authorized financing. In the next slides, colleagues, we are going to three uh, even a deep a, a step deeper where we're going to look at how uh, we have a few examples on how to do it maybe or a few examples on how we need to risk rate it and how to mitigate uh, this specific risk and then for more information that maybe i i could be missing something you can uh, go to kindness not seven as i mentioned a bit earlier so the bullet point that is below is stating that RPA methodology risk tolerance, you need to look at your tolerance as an organization. As I mentioned a bit earlier, whether you have a low risk, medium risk, or high risk tolerance. If you have a, a low risk tolerance, for example, in one aspect that, uh, let's say, we'll, we'll take the clients. If you're not dealing with high risk clients, you'll say that, no, my risk tolerance for uh, high risk clients is very low, so I won't take them uh, as business. But if it is, you, you have a high risk tolerance for those specific clients, you'll say that, no, I take them, you specify it on, on your RMCP, and then you put measures in place to mitigate the risk that, that those clients will be posing to your institution or to your organization. And then that's, that's what the bullet point is saying, but you must put that in detail. Note it in detail, specify it, say it uh, as clear as it can be so that it should be easily uh, manageable and it should be easily seen by anyone who needs to know about it. So we're going to look at the money laundering and terrorist risk, uh, financing or uh, management cycle. The first part, which is identify and assess, you need to identify and assess the risk that your entity is facing that relate to money laundering, terrorist financing, and pro proliferation financing of risk. You need to determine the entity's tolerance to risk, as I mentioned on, on the previous slides. You need to develop methodologies, determine the client risk, and apply the customer due diligence where you'll be testing the customers, all the clients that you have. What we should not forget is that all the clients that you take on for business, they need to be risk rated. You need to know what type of clients you're dealing with, whether it's a high-risk client, medium-risk client, and a low-risk client. And then if it's a low-risk client, what measures do you have in place? High-risk client, what, do you, what measures do you have in place? Do you need advanced uh, due diligence, for example, for high-risk and uh, less to no due diligence for low-risk clients? You need to continue with oversight based uh, on uh, the risk that you identify. So you need to continuously go back and review because the risk changes. The risk that you identify today does not mean that if a client is low risk today, tomorrow the client will still be low risk. 
circumstances uh, changes. It could be time, it could be environment, it could be an area that will change uh, the risk of that line. So go back and review them and then uh, update your risk management compliance program to suit the type of business and clients that you have uh, for, for any uh, uh, given state. So the basic uh, framework that we, we, we can look at when we're identifying risk, uh, we have five. There's, these are, are, for example, purposes. So we have five uh, 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 factors that we have identified. So the first one is products and services. What type of products are you offering? The second one is delivery channel. How do you get your products or your services to the clients? Geogra geogra geographic risk area. Where is the entity? Client type? Is it an initial person, a legal person, a simple structure, if it's a legal person, or a complex structure? Other factors uh, that my, uh, we, we are going to look at. So we start with product and services. On product and services, are you dealing with a, a client face-to-face, -face, or is a client using a third party, an agent, to conduct a business? In most instances, when you identify a risk, it's easier to deal with someone you see than someone that you don't see or someone you don't, you don't know. And then you need to identify the beneficial owner or the ultimate beneficial owner when you're dealing with third parties. You need to know the person who will receive the end or the fruits of the product that you, you, you are dealing with. So those are things you need to identify. And then are you using cash or EFT to facilitate the, 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 the transaction? Is the transaction happening within the borders of South Africa or outside of uh, South Africa? I, uh, are you using dollars, pullers, rents, and then what type of uh, measures do you have in place to convert the currency that you have and put it where it's supposed to be? And then that's what you need to, to look at. Duration of a relationship, is it a, a new client? Or is it a client that you've known for a long time? Is it a, a once-off deal or a, a, a continuous transaction that you'll have over a period of years? Delivery channel, which is our, is our second uh, factor. Uh, is it, do we have a direct relationship? Now, go, going back to face-to-face -to -face again, uh, working through an intermediary, which is an agent or someone else, or face-to-face -face or face-to-face. -to -face. And then there's a delivery channel. Because in most instances, e, people, when they're dealing with money laundering, it's easy to cover uh, the proceeds of crime and then the final person will be receiving the money if you're not dealing with the person face-to-face. -face. You can get uh, someone who is a middleman who's facilitating how that money, that money should be cleaned. Geographic area risk, we are looking at uh, South Africa versus foreign jurisdiction. In foreign jurisdictions as well, you should know. For example, if you're dealing with someone from Mexico, where maybe the place is more prevalent for drugs and drug trafficking, look at the source of funds from the area. Look at the source of funds from that specific person. If you're dealing someone, with someone from DRC, for example, you know that some places like DRC and some parts of West Africa, they are blood diamonds. You should be you should ask those questions so they understand what type of business they're entering into. If we bring it uh, back home, back to South Africa, sometimes you'll be dealing with people who are, are high, uh, public figures, who are uh, influential. And then someone, or entrepreneurs, for example, you should know that some of this money, they'll use it in different ways. They can buy a, a beach house or a holiday home somewhere in, in the coast and then they sell it in, in two or, or, or three months. These are issues that we identified and then you need to be able to identify it as a client, as a, a, a private practitioner. So that when it happens that enforcement bodies come knocking at your door anytime sooner or later, you should be aware that uh, you were informed and then you know about these things and then you have measures in place to mitigate the risk that might be exposed by the type of business or geographic area that you, you are dealing with. For example, it can be a simple uh, thing. If someone is buying a property at uh, Johannesburg CPD, the risk of that area is totally different from the risk of someone buying a place, maybe a property maybe in uh, Cosmo City. So those will be uh, 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 different aspects or different things that you have to look at. If someone buys a property in the Karoo, that risk is different from someone who's buying a property in, in Umtlanga. So look at the client type and type of geographic area that you are dealing in or dealing with, and then put uh, measures in place and identify the risk that is associated with the geographic area that you, you, you are having. Are you dealing with people from high-risk countries? For example, DRC, as I mentioned earlier, or Democratic Republic of Congo. And then you must know what's happening. Uh, client uh, confidentiality in other jurisdictions, if maybe it's a trans-country uh, transaction, someone from Egypt buying property in South Africa, or someone from Sevastopol or Croatia buying property in South Africa, or an American 
buying in dollars in South Africa, you must understand what risk that poses and then what you need to, uh, to do as a property practitioner or as a business. Is that person uh, connecting business in a weak regulatory area? Is a South African uh, buying a property in New Zealand or Australia and then you are facilitating the transaction? What measures do you have in place to understand what type of transaction is, is, uh, are you having? Is, that, is it cash? Is it uh, through EFT? Is it maybe through a, a loan from a financial institution? So a client type, by dealing with an international person or a legal person, uh, normally when I think of a national person, it's easier because we can identify the person. If it's a legal uh, person, sometimes they tend to have complex structures where you won't find a beneficial owner or the ultimate person who will be uh, receiving the proceeds of the transaction. So you need to identify to the one blood or the one body, the one person who is entering into a transaction. Don't just end at a business level and then you don't ask any further questions. Ask more questions. Uh, go to the specific person who's going to be uh, benefiting. Politically exposed person, high risk individuals in some instances, not at all, uh, at all instances, but you must risk rate them. And then whether it's a, a foreign prominent political person or uh, a local prominent uh, a person, identify them, assess them, risk rate them, and then continue with the transaction. Prominence, uh, prominence, it could be anyone. It could be someone who is a high uh, business figure. It could be someone who is from a, 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 royal a royal background. So you need to identify these pe people as well and, and understand what risk they might be posing during those transactions. Address information, that's really available. That's public knowledge. It's something that maybe you see uh, on the news or you can Google the client's name and then you see what type of negative media covering is the person having. And then are you, uh, if maybe for example someone stole money and then is trying to take the money, uh, to clean the money through you, you must be clear with that person and then you, you, you must report where it's supposed to be reported. Malondering findings or international uh, pattern. If for example someone sells oranges to Iran compared to someone who's selling telecommunications in Iran or someone who's, uh, who's selling uh, weapons, to Iran. Those are three different risks. All of them could be, could be your clients, and then they might be buying property from you, but you must understand what that client type and geographic area uh, poses to your business or money laundering or terrorist financing or proliferation financing. So other factors that you can look at is money laundering approach of the business entity or the country. Sanctions, are those individual sanctions? For example, the, the our domestic uh, neighbor, our domestic issue, the neighbor that we have, uh, Zimbabwe, for example. In Zimbabwe, some individuals in Zimbabwe are sanctioned. If you go to uh, an open uh, United Nations Security Council's uh, list of sanctioned individuals, you type the name of, the, of your client. If a client appears on that specific list, you can't do business with that specific client. Strategy of NTT, what strategy does the business or the person that at limit have? Risk assessment and risk rating. So how do we re uh, risk rate that specific uh, Score, that's what we just discussed on the previous slides. You need to assign different ratings, uh, ca rating categories to different levels of risk. For example, high, medium, or low risk for a mal from a mal laundering, terrorist financing, or proliferation risk perspective. And there's no one size fits all approach. Companies, individuals, entities are, are not the same. People are different, companies are different, so you must individually access and then risk rate the specific entity. We need to consider the consequences and the impacts of money laundering and or terrorist financing, including proliferation financing into your business. And then what impact will it have should you be found to be assisting or abating people who are in uh, who are dealing uh, in money laundering. You need to consider the likelihood of money laundering and terrorist financing risk occurring into your, your organization. Is it, is it highly likely? Is it medium, is it low, or is none, is, is next to non existent? And then risk scale, uh, tailored to, to size of an accountable institution and range of products offered. So it depends on what type, type of products you offer. If someone sells houses in Bryanston, can't be seen with the same view or with the same eye with someone who sells houses in Soweto. So those are things that, that you, you have to look at. Risk rating uh, may change when you're reevaluating at an ongoing uh, pace or at an ongoing basis, as we mentioned a bit earlier, whether it's quarterly, biannually, or annually. So risk rating methodology must be documented on the RMCP, which is the Risk Management Compliance Program, and it must be detailed and very, very, very clear. Now, uh, colleagues, I'm going to take you through uh, our risk assessment and, and rating. 
So now uh, we have, we're going to look at the client as we mentioned the other five on, on the previous site. So now we're, we're just going a step, one step deeper. Client product and services, which is, is, is what you'll be selling to client, uh, to your uh, stakeholders, geographic factors, delivery channel, and other. So now the first example that we have within your organization, you have a product de de department, and then the type of uh, uh, business that the, the department deals with is low number of high risk client, and then uh, use of cash not prevalent, uh, the buying bonds or the buying property, and then the business is predominantly in how in Houting. Houting is a high uh, crime area, so the risk of money laundering in any form will be higher compared to the Northern Cape uh, Kuruman, or for example, or, or, or Kimberley. So that should be at a, 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 a different risk rating. So this type of uh, uh, transaction happens face to face. So that's the, that's our channel, uh, deliver channel. Other factors that we considered for this specific one is media reports that indicate numerous purchases by high profile politicians. So the risk rating that we gave this entity or this type of transaction is medium. The next example that we have is property and is rental a department within the property purchases uh, entity or estate agency and where we have a high number of high risk clients and the number of transactions are in cash. So that's a question mark as well, because in most cases, if you don't report cash, you need to ask the person, where do you get this cash from? And then only how thing, and then what we need to consider as well is illicit use of rental property in some instances where people will pay a uh, rent in advance for two years. And then after they pay rent in advance for two years, they come back after that month saying that, no, they can, they can, you can cancel the lease, you can find them, but they want their money back. There's a question mark. You can't pay a rent up front for two years or a year, and then you want your money back. And then now the, he paid you in cash. Now, when you pay back the money to him, you are only going to transfer him that money to his bank account. So that's a problem. That's a, a classic state of people trying to clean dirty money. Media reports and high level of tender corruption, as we mentioned a bit earlier, that's what you have to look at. And then look at what is detailed maybe on our sector risk assessment uh, findings. So this form of transaction appears to be a high risk uh, transaction, but you need to put measures in place to mitigate this risk and then make sure that you understand how to deal with this uh, specific risk. Now we're going to give them a, a score. We're going to look at a risk matrix per entity and then the risk uh, on the risk assessment that we conducted. So we have five examples that we have and then we have risked, uh, uh, rated them high, medium and low risk. So this should happen uh, prior you enter into a business with the client. So at on, on onboarding, when you do your uh, fact finding or establishing a rapport with, with your client, that's when you need to uh, conduct this type of uh, rating. So the first example that we have, we have a natural person. Uh, he's purchasing a, a product. This product is a whole day home. And the guy is from DRC, as I mentioned a bit earlier. This transaction is not face to face, and the person is non is unemployed. So client type is initial person. Because initial person, we give, we give them a score of one. Uh, because we are dealing with a person, uh, an initial person which does not have a complex structure compared to a legal person, and then it's purchasing a holiday home, and then it's from TRC. Holiday homes are known to be expensive. If you don't uh, own a primary resident. And then you purchase a holiday home in South Africa, that would be a question mark. And then the score that you give for that is a three. It's a nine face-to-face -face transaction. And then we give it a score of a three as well, because we're not seeing this person. He could be in PRC, we're just conducting our business through emails, WhatsApp, or telephone call, or any of those things. He's unemployed. How does he, how does he afford a holiday home if he's unemployed? How can he buy? A whole day old home he's, uh, when he's employed. So when you, we add those numbers, the, the risk, the, the, the rating that we gave you at three, the delivery channel, geographic area, product type at three as well, client type uh, one, they add up to 13, which is a, high, is a high risk. So you need to monitor this client and see what type of business is he engaging in. Ask more questions so that you understand exactly how is he, his source of funds if he's not employed and then he has money to buy a holiday home anywhere within the Republic. And then the second example we have is a legal entity. This uh, person is purchasing a, a, a chemical uh, workshop. He's South African and the transaction is uh, face to face. And then the chemical workshop is 
than is, is, is for is to is to be used for cold testing a laboratory. And then uh, we'll they said that a uh, medium risk. The reason for that is a legal entity which the risk could be a bit higher than a client. You remember that uh, nothing is in black and white. You need to ask yourself questions and then uh, rate them according to the risk that has been identified. Because not two individuals or two entities are the same. A purchase of chemical a workshop, there's a high risk because chemicals can be used in different uh, ways. It can be used to form a lot of things that can be used in illicit ways or in ways that are not uh, legal. South Africa, geographic area, uh, uh, the research we related is two. Face-to-face -face is one. Cold testing laboratory, okay. It's okay, and then we're saying that, no, we know what the chemicals are going to be used for. The risk rating that we gave them is a nine. So please, 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 please be our colleagues that this is only for illustrative purposes and no actual risk cause such as just as assessed by us. So you need to restrict your clients or your business and entities or anything that you're dealing with according to the specifications of your business, not what we are saying. We're just giving you an example so that you'll be able to understand what needs to be placed or what needs to be included in your risk management compliance uh, program. When I continue, colleagues, and now we're looking at how to assess malnutrition, proliferation financing, terrorist financing risk, and assign ratings. Accountable institutions uh, list indicator and characteristic example on the left hand side, and then we, we are going to follow that by accountable institutions assessment of inherent risk, unpacking, understanding the risk examples, risk uh, rating, as we g gave the similar examples on the previous slide. So now we have a client type. This one is a national person is employed. And then most instances where the client uh, is full time employed, that tends to be uh, less or lower possibility of monitoring or terrorist or proliferation financing risk. Because he'll work for the money, we see that the money comes from A to B and then he'll use it on C. So the risk rating that we give that it will be one. And a client type is a legal person, a complex structure, so it's a company or a, a, a CC or any of those. So according to five guidance, the trends indicate that these types of clients are higher or are susceptible to malandering, terrorist financing, and proliferation financing risk through the beneficial ownership because we are unable to identify the own body behind the transaction. The next one is line type is a legal person. There's a trust. A trust, uh, normally, beneficiaries of a trust is difficult to identify them. So they tend to be a high risk. And the trends, international trends and local uh, domestic trends, they indicate a higher susceptibility of trust being used to launder money. For example, uh, internationally, the Panama Papers, where a lot of people had transactions in Panama, and then they had a lot of type of businesses that uh, people did not know who was the owner of, or who was the person receiving the proceeds of those uh, of those funds. So that will, uh, the rating that you gave there is a three. And the next one is the client type, is a legal person, which is a company dealing with tenders, and then there's a question mark. These ones are subject to more abuse by criminals. Domestic trends indicate higher susceptibility to uh, risk, and we need to consider the commission reports. For example, the Zondo Commission and all other factors that are in public knowledge when you're dealing with individuals who are implicated in such uh, topic, topics. Client type, we have an immediate family member of a foreign prominent public official who is a foreign uh, politician. It could be someone from Africa, someone from the Americas, North or South, uh, then America, Europe, or Asia, or Oceania. Those are the people actually that you need to look at as well. They tend to be high risk clients because they uh, tend to take public funds and then they use them in illicit ways. So, and then the DPIP is a domestic prominent important person, which are our local domestic uh, politicians. Those ones also are subject to more abuse by criminals and then they tend to indicate high accessibility to money laundering risk. And then these two, the DPP, the DPIPs and the FPPOs, you need to look at them uh, accordingly. Please uh, don't forget, look at what uh, PCC 54 and guidance note 7 entails on how to deal with a, a, a politically exposed person or people of high importance. And then uh, the guidance actually is, as well that we, you can look at is the FATF, FATF guidance. On FATF, they speak mostly on how to deal with the 
foreign or international clients or persons or political, politically exposed peace, uh, persons coming from other uh, uh, countries. And the trends that you get when you're looking at the federal guidelines that uh, they are high risk in most instances. We're not saying that it's in black and white. We're not saying that it's a, a gospel truth. But you have to look at it, understand it, and then you need to know how to deal with them as an accountable institution. Thank you, colleagues. And then now we are looking at how to assess money laundering and terrorist financing risk and how to assign the ratings. So now the example that we have again is a client type which is a natural person who's unemployed. And then the client, when the client is unemployed, the trends indicate a medium possibility of money laundering risk. And then we need to consider source of funds at all times. And then we have a legal person in the form of a, of a partnership. This is a business, this is an entity, which is a partnership of different individuals. And then as an accountable institution, you need to assess various factors and characteristics uh, and look at the documents that these ind individuals are, are bringing forward and assign uh, ratings as well as per the risk that you're going to identify. Product type, now we're dealing with a trust. They're setting up of a trust. And then the trends indicate that when you're dealing with a trust, again, we have a, a higher susceptibility to risk. And then as property practitioners, in most instances, our business allows us to deal with uh, immovable property. So subject to that, uh, immovable property subject to abuse by criminals. In most instances, criminals would buy the property in cash or maybe they buy it on loan or in, uh, using a bond. They settle it within the first six months or the first three months and then they sell it. So you need to look at transactions like that as well. You should, you should be able to determine the source of funds. You should not get into a transaction where, where you are unable to identify the source of, of, of funds. And then this form of transactions are high, highly susceptible to risk. Delivery channel, as we mentioned, either face to face or not, geographic area is a place closer to, closer to the border. Which border is it? Is it a coastal border where people are coming through a ship? Is it a landlock uh, from a, from a London country or any of our neighbors? What type types of transactions are happening close uh, to that uh, specific place? Even outside jurisdictions, is the client that they're dealing with from uh, Syria? Is the client they're dealing with from any place or that maybe? Uh, they're subject to sanctions. You need to be able to identify that and deal with that individual in accordance with what is uh, required. So now we, I think we're about to finish on the risk rating matrix. So we're just going to look at uh, what you need to consider when you're dealing with uh, these individuals. Please do not forget, I can't emphasize this, this uh, even uh, further. Please do not forget that when you're dealing with a legal entity, whether it's a partnership, a close corporation, a company, p ltd or any form of uh, an entity identify who is, the who is the beneficial owner, who is the ultimate beneficial owner of the proceeds of the transaction. This rate at onboarding, when you're starting uh, with your client, so that is by doing a customer due diligence, follow the stages based upon the client type and the indicators as suggested or as stipulated uh, by the FIC Act. But for more guidance, look at guidance note seven. Example of client type, risk rating, so this, again, colleagues, is, is an illustrative uh, slide. This is an illustrative, uh, it's an example that we're giving you as, as a FIC. So the client type, a legal entity with sanctioned beneficial ownership, so the risk would be high because the person is, is sanctioned. That's why I was asking you, please look at the one body. Legal entity with the beneficial ownership, no negative findings, that will give it a, a low risk. A legal entity with a, a foreign, foreign prominent public official who is a beneficial owner is a high risk. Legal entity with a domestic prominent important person who is a beneficial owner, that's a high risk. And then a new products and services to determine money laundering Collaboration financing and terrorist financing risk and ratings, product type, product, service, and then we look at uh, the product type again. So the product and service type in this example, we have a property management uh, department. Uh, the only thing they're dealing with is renovations within accountable institutions. So renovations is, is low risk because it will be property that's already owned. The rental department, for example, or a rental company, uh, a rental section of the company, we have an accountable institution where we look at various sectors, factors and characteristics, documents, the same and assignment and ratings. Product type, property uh, registration, 
And then uh, product registration tends to be higher if you don't know the ultimate beneficial owner. International clients subject to more scrutiny if, for example, they are using cash as the firm form of um, means of concluding the transaction. This based approach, treatment of risk, risk monitoring, mitigation and management, treatment of risk. So please do not forget that you need to put measures in place. After you, you, you've identified risk, you've assessed it, you monitor it, you need to put processes and systems uh, in place, resources, which is individuals or uh, it could be software or hardware, monitoring, go back and relook at it uh, at a specific uh, risk, and then report uh, to the FIC as stipulated under Section 28 20, and 29 of the FIC Act. Training, don't forget to go back to your staff, train them at all times and make sure that they understand what uh, malaria risk entails. The controls must be in proportion to the risk. So as I mentioned a bit earlier, if you're dealing with someone from a high risk area, put measures in, in, in place. So make sure that you have enhanced due diligence to deal with those issues. Medium risk, only additional due, due diligence. While lower risk uh, on malaria is only, you'll only put simplified uh, due diligence. Risk will be adequately treated, should be, should be adequately treated, or will be adequately treated, actually, if you have identified and then you put these measures in place, according to the level that you've seen for the specific risk. And then now, uh, customer due diligence. Uh, on customer due diligence, uh, issues that must be addressed is uh, we've covered them, actually, on the first slides. And then don't forget just to look at guidance note 7, PCC 22, PCC 30, PCC guidance note, GN's guidance note, and PCC is public compliance communication. Those are publications that we issue as the FIC for public to understand if maybe there's something that a section of the act does not specify. You have to go to the public compliance commission, uh, public compliance communication, where you will see exactly what the specific section of the act is uh, detailing. So, and then section 42 to see, and uh, you need to ensure that there are no anonymous clients and you need to obtain a record of ones of under 5,000 rents transaction for all the clients that you're entering into. What information and documentation would be required uh, per money laundering uh, risk rating? For national persons, what is required? You need to look at section 21, section 20, right with section 42, the uh, guidance note seven, uh, section 21B to be specific of the FIC Act for national persons, legal entities, trusts and partnerships. Specify what type of customer due diligence is required for higher risk versus low risk clients. And you need to understand and obtain information on a business relationship by providing for the manner in which the institution will determine whether future transactions will be performed in the course of the business relationship are uh, inconsistent with the institution's knowledge of the prospective client. So I understand the client. What I can say that you, when you're entering in some of these transactions, you need to know your client uh, like a palm of, or as a palm of your hand. And then you need to provide a manner in which and process by which the institution conducts additional due diligence. Also provide the manner in which and the process by which ongoing due diligence for more direct risk is going to be conducted. You need to put place uh, measures uh, that will allow you to understand complex and unusual large transactions or unusual patterns per transactions of the uh, accountable institution. The example that we made is that someone rents for two years and then he's, uh, he comes back to a uh, property practitioner and asks uh, the rental income. Someone buys a property and then waits for three months to be registered. Once the property registered after three months, he sells it maybe for less than what he bought it for. He buys a property for 10 million, he sells the property for 6 million. There should be a question mark. Why can you be willing to sell within three months and then be willing to take such a huge knock on the specific property? And then consider customer children when there is a suspicious or unusual transaction or activity that is detected from the entity. And you need to determine when and how a relationship uh, will, uh, with, will be terminated when customer due diligence is not obtained. So beneficial ownership, what you have to look at, identify each initial person who is controlling ownership interest in the legal person, if you are in doubt. Identify each initial person who exercises control of the legal entity. 
through other means. For example, you must use a proxy. Identify each natural person who exercises control over the management of that legal person. Management directors, those are people who will be making decisions and uh, on behalf of, this, of, this, of a specific entity. Now we're looking at section 42 uh, to us, what information will be scrutinized and against which list to determine uh, if a client is sanctioned. So if a client is sanctioned, we have to look at uh, the list that is published by the United Nations, specifically the United Nations Security Council list UN1267 and the TFS list that is published on the website of the FIC Act. So look at the tariff financial sanctions aimed at terrorist financing, tariff financial sanctions aimed at proliferation financing, when to scrutinize, what process, uh, processes to follow when a match and non-match is identified through the transaction. How do you go about freezing the process or the transaction that you are engaged in? Evidence of screening and then what broader measures aimed at a broader sanction applications are you going to apply? Don't forget to look at guidance note 6A, guidance note 7, PCC 44, section 28A, section 29 of the figure. Section 29 is reporting of suspicious transactions and then section 28A is when you are dealing with a property that is owned by a terrorist prop, uh, person or a, trans, uh, a, a, a terrorist organization. So in 28A, an accountable institution must scrutinize client information against a target financial sanction list published in terms of section 26A of the FIC Act, section 25 of Product Tara Act. Accountable institutions may not establish business relationship with or conduct single transactions on behalf of sanctions, sanctioned persons. Permanent official persons, uh, when you're dealing with PIPs, we've covered a bit earlier, and then look at guidance note 7, PC 51, section 21. Section 21G, Section 21H, and then Schedule 3A and 3P of the FIC Act. There will be amendments to the FIC Act that will be happening in the coming uh, months, but keep your communication channels open so that you'll be able to converse with you and give you more information on what impact is that going to have on your business. But don't forget also to look at uh, how to determine if the client is a DPIP or an FPO. The easiest way you can do it is by asking the person or asking the question, or do some additional due diligence or some additional research when I'm dealing with individuals. And then each and every time when I'm dealing with an FPO or a DP, you must obtain a senior management approval from your organization to establish the business relationship. And then you need to establish source of wealth for all these individuals. And conduct enhanced due diligence and monitoring uh, as is stipulated on the RMCP as we discussed a bit earlier, whether it's quarterly, biannually or annually. And then don't forget to use uh, data sources as well. Uh, account monitoring and reporting, we've covered this under section 21C, 21C, we've covered on the previous slide. And then we've covered also the suspicious transaction reporting uh, stipulated under section 29 of the FIC Act. The suspicion shouldn't be that you know that the person has done wrong. If you suspect that the person has done wrong, if you just think that no, there could be something that is not becoming with this transaction, you need to report to the Financial Intelligence Center. Because if it happens that it is identified at a later stage, and then you can't, there's a maxim that is always applicable in law. Ignorance of the law is never an excuse. So you'll never say that, no, I didn't know, I didn't see, I didn't apply my mind. If there's a suspicion, when a term of, of prosecution or persecution or enforcement uh, comes into effect, those are mitigation circumstances that are going to be taken into consideration. So do not forget to always report suspicious uh, transactions. So account monitoring and account monitoring institution, uh, an account institution must monitor transactions, establish source of funds, and ensure, ensure it is consistent with the client's business and risk profile, and also establish a background and purpose of all transactions. Doubts and veracity as stipulated on section 21D. So we're now looking at the final part of our presentation. Out of the five obligations that are put on the cultural institutions, we're looking at uh, reporting. So section 28 of the FIC Act, there's a customer, uh, there's a cash threshold uh, reporting. Uh, cash payment reporting, all transactions that are above uh, 25,000, but this amount uh, in the near future could uh, be increased to 50,000. 
And then TPR, ter Terrorist Financing Reporting, uh, or Financial Sanctions Reporting, that's Section 28A, or the transaction or the property that is owned by a terrorist person, you need to report that. Section 29 is a suspicious transaction, as we mentioned on the previous slide. Section 31 hasn't come into effect, yes. There's a cross-border money movement uh, reporting. And as soon as it comes up, I think we'll be able to communicate through to you, and then you will know exactly what you need to report. As uh, it is stipulated under Section 31 of the uh, FIC Act. Section 27. At any given moment, the, the Financial Intelligence Center can request information from accountable institutions or reporting institutions or any other person who must report at any given moment. So you must have this information readily available. This information can relate to previous clients, current clients, and other persons. The type and status of business relationships with these persons. And then Section 32, the, and then the FIC can also request additional information regarding Section 28, 29, or 31 of their accountable institutions or other persons who must uh, report. Record keeping, we mentioned a bit earlier that please keep the records for five years after the transaction has been concluded. Look at guidance note seven, PCC 12A, section 30, uh, 22 of the FIG 8, section 22A, section 23, and section 24 of the FIG 8. Also, this is covered under Regulation 20 of the regulations of the Financial Intel Intelligence Center Act. The question that you, you, you must know, you must specify uh, the records for CDD or at enhanced customer due diligence or additional due, due diligence. Retain must be kept or detail must be kept where it is not kept. How long it will be kept? For example, five years? Five years after the transition has been concluded. In what form it will be kept? Is it a third party keeping the records? If so, how are they keeping them? How are, is easily, are they easily accessible? How can we get these specific transactions when they are requested? Registration. As an accountable institution, you are required by Section 42 S to register with the FIC Act. And these details must be kept up to date with the FIC Act. Always update them should anything change. Should your complaints officer, your address, your telephone number, your email address, anything change inform the Financial Intelligence Center Act. Registration information to be obtained, to be maintained at all times, and who is responsible for a person, whether it's a compliance officer or one of the people who are reporting to the directors or to the executives as appointed by the company. Process to be followed, including timelines when uh, any information uh, changes. And then look at Directive 1, and then please, uh, uh, for registration, the only place that you can register with the FIC and for report submission is uh, the GoAML platform. So look at Directive 1 on how uh, GoAML or how to register using GoAML and then how uh, to use AML uh, as stipulated under Section 43P of the FIC Act. Now, if you don't comply with customer diligence, record keeping, reporting, risk management, uh, as uh, uh, stipulated under the FIC Act, or training, governance, or money laundering, there are different administrative sections that will be given to you. Most of them start from 10 million for a national person, and then they go up to 50 million for a legal person. So for say, if you're not compliant with section 20A, 21, 21A to 8, and then you, uh, you might be fined 10 to 50 million. So if you don't comply with all the sections or the obligations that you've just mentioned, according to the FIC Act, you might be fined up to 10 million as an individual, and then as a legal person, you might be fined up to 50 million, while the specific section that will deal with the criminal element of this part will be the product tara, and then that's when you will be facing jail time for not complying with uh, these specific sections. Uh, sections. Thank you, colleagues. I hope I didn't put you to sleep. And then I hope that you were able to listen to this uh, session and I hope that you had an informative session. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to call us on www.fic.co.za or and we also have a, a public compliance query where you can place only queries on our website, and then that is a, a PQP query, and then from there, 
we also have a contact center where you can give us a call. So I think everything now will be showing on your screen. So for our contact center, complex contact center, you can call us on 012-641-6000. And then I hope that you have a great day, colleagues, and then keep warm. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.